Boy, I tell you, I'm excited about all that God is doing. Aren't you excited about the concert and all that God did there? Amen? And so I tell you, I really uh, praise the Lord for Bob and Eileen. They are dear friends of mine. In fact, in the picture there, the plaid shirt was me sitting next to Bob. So we and I trained together. We have a great time. And, and I tell you, I hope you'll continue to pray for our missionaries and that you'll support them. Uh, this is uh, intended to be a love gift to our missionaries for Christmas, and uh, we hope that you'll uh, make that a priority for, um, for by next week. So let's turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. You know, everybody loves a start over, a restart, a comeback, a renewal. There's a lot of comeback stories in life. A story about an individual or a group of people or an organization or a team or a business that when they're facing the impossible, when they're facing adversity, they somehow overcome the odds and they win. History is full of this stuff. And it's really fun to think about it. I, I think about the story of Bernie Marcus. I mean, you don't know who Bernie Marcus is. Oh, you're going to learn something today. Bernie Marcus was the son of a poor Russian cabinet maker. He lived in Newark, New Jersey in 1978. He was fired by a retail store called Handy Dan. Okay? And what, what do you do when you've been fired from Handy Dan, right? Well, Bernie teamed up with a guy named Arthur Blank, and they decided to start their own business. They opened their first store in Atlanta, Georgia. It was called the Home Depot. Today, they have stores all over the world. Or how about this? How about Wilma Randolph? Wilma Randolph was, was the 20th child of 22 children. Boy, wouldn't you like to be that mom and dad? She was born prematurely, and her survival was doubtful. And when she was four years of age, she got double pneumonia, and she contracted scarlet fever. She was left with a paralyzing left leg. At age nine, she removed the metal brace that she had been dependent on and began to walk without it. At age 13, she developed a rhythmic walk, which doctors said was an absolute miracle. The same year, she decided to become a runner. She entered a race and came in last. And for the next few years, every race that she entered, she came in last. Everyone told her to quit, but she kept on running. And one day, she actually won a race, and then another, and from then on, and she won every race she entered. Eventually, this little girl, who was told she would never walk again, won three Olympic gold medals in running. Did you know that General Douglas MacArthur was turned down when he applied for admission to West Point? Not once, but twice. And it was the third time that he finally marched into the history books. How about Albert Einstein, who developed the theory of relativity? Did you know that he was expelled from school for being dumb? At age... Um, in, in a six-month period, he taught himself calculus. In 1905, he published three papers that revolutionized man's image of the physical universe, and he helped lay the foundation for the nuclear age. One of the papers offered an explanation of the photoelectric effect, which concerns the emission of electrons from metal surfaces exposed to light. Theoretically, this study represented a cornerstone of the quantum theory and practically, it made possible many great inventions, including television and automated systems. How about Thomas Edison? Did you know that Thomas Edison was kicked out of school because he could do nothing, they could do nothing with him? The teachers told his mother he was just too slow to learn, so little Thomas was homeschooled by his mother. He made a quick comeback, and at the age of 10, he had already set up his first chemistry laboratory. He became our nation's most famous inventor with inventions as the light bulb, phonograph, and the kaleidoscope. And he synchronized these, and he produced motion pictures. This is how we do motion pictures today. 
He gave us over 1,300 inventions. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was paralyzed by polio at age 39, and he went on to become one of the most beloved and influential leaders in American history. He's being elected president of the United States four times. You know, there's biblical comebacks. There's biblical renewals. There's biblical start orders. How about Joseph, who went from the pit to the palace and became the prime minister of Egypt? How about King David? After his falling into sin, he had a comeback after his fall. How about Job, who certainly qualifies as one of the greatest comebacks of all time? He lost his entire family, lost his wealth, and through a series of events, God restored him into a miraculous comeback. How about John Mark, who, who, uh, who would qualify after falling his, failing after his first missionary journey? How about Peter? Peter would be at the top of the list who denied the Lord three times, and then all of a sudden he turns around, and at the day of Pentecost, he proclaims to the world the glories of Jesus. Folks, God is about comebacks. God is about restarts. He's about startovers. He's about renewal. Times when we set aside the previous experiences, where we deal with, the, with them properly, and we move in faith to a new adventure that God has in store for us. Folks, this is the nature of faith. It's the nature of risk. It's the nature of trust. It's the nature of the Christian life that God has called us to. We are to be renewal people. People that are constantly renewing ourselves before the Creator. Renewing ourselves to new adventures. Renewing ourselves to new acts of faith. Renewing ourselves to a place where God says, yes, you had a great run here, but I'm going to give you another run. A better run. God wants us to be people of renewal. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah 43, he says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. You do not perceive it. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. We get so hung up into what we've been in, and, and don't misunderstand. Our past has good things, things that we've learned, things that we can be thankful for. But our past also can have pain and hurt and misdirection and sin and misunderstanding and, and hurtfulness and disappointment. And sadly, many of us, we bring our past into the present. And this creates a problem for us. The longer that you live in the past, the less future you have to enjoy. You just need to hear that. And not only that, let's just be honest, we tend to idolize the past. People say that the past, that when we look back, it's 2020, and I tell them, no, it's not 2020. It's not clear vision. It's idealism. When we look to the past, we look to idealism. Because we forget the circumstances. We forget the sin. We forget the hurt. We forget the pain. We forget the things that are going on at that time. And by the way, most people, when they talk about the glory days, they hated the glory days. They did. When they were in it, they hated it. And yet when we look back on it, all of a sudden it's got this rosy, rosy liner. And the problem is it's not true. It's idealism. And God knows this. But at the same time, in the Word of God, God has given us things that we need to remember. For example, He told the children of Israel to remember the Passover. Amen? Why? To propel them forward in faith. It was never to idolize the Passover. It was never intended to become a ritual of idolization. It was intended to become a memory that drove them to trust God again. Amen? Guess what communion is, folks? It's the same thing. It's intended for us to remember what God has done. Remember the cross. Remember He buried and rose again. Remember the blood of Jesus that forgave our sins. And then propel us to serve Him more gloriously. Amen? So there's sometimes the memory of the past is a good thing if it propels us forward. But if it doesn't propel us forward, if it's intended to be idolized, 
intended to be memorialized in a way that doesn't drive us to new adventures in Christ, it becomes an unhealthy thing. Amen? Let me, let me tell you, Jesus said it this way. He says, Jesus said in the New Testament, he said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. He says, if you're going to serve in my kingdom, you got to keep focus forward. you got to start saying, hey, thank God for this, but I'm moving on. I, I tell people all the time that I thank God for my past but I also thank God that it is my past. Amen? I've got to live in today and what God has for me and what He has for me moving forward. When I came to Christ, I I didn't grow up in a Christian home, folks, and I know a lot of you have. And and you may not understand this, but when, when you don't grow up in a Christian home, you deal with a lot of different dynamics. And I thank God for my dad's integrity. And I want you to know that. I really do. I thank him for his integrity. My dad is with the Lord today. He came to Christ about three years after I came to Christ. But I will tell you that as much as I think about those good things, there are a lot of things that I really did not like about that piece of my life. Things that I swore I would never do as a father, I would never do as a husband. And I haven't by the grace of God. But I will tell you that when you understand where you've come from and the pains and the hurts and the things that are engaged in all that, it causes you to think about the future in a very new way. So do I thank God for my past? Yes. Do I thank God for my father? You bet. He taught me a lot of good things. He taught me a lot of things not to do also. But he didn't know any better. He wasn't redeemed. He didn't have the Savior. And so when I think back, when I, when I came to Christ, I didn't want my life to be the same. I knew that Christ was alive. And by the way, Christ being alive is the greatest comeback in history. Amen? The fact that He's alive today, that He dwells in you, that He dwells in me, and that He's giving us a future. Folks, Do you realize when we don't embrace that, how irresponsible we are being? Here Christ dies, buried, rises again, and then gives us His Spirit to live within us, to give us guidance for the future, and we get stuck in the past? Think about that one for a minute. That's like unlocking a massive door for your child, a massive opportunity for your child, and your child doesn't value it. I've been there. I've done some things for my kids that that later they didn't value it. It's the greatest comeback. And I truly believe that when, when Christ came into my life, I believe that God had a plan for my life and a new journey for me. I believed in that. And I believed in it so much, I remember sitting in a youth group meeting one day and our youth pastor was talking to us about Verses of Scripture that just resonate with your soul, that define who you are. And and he called them a life verse. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Nobody? Yeah, okay. It's one of those things where you look in the Scriptures and you, you find a verse of Scripture that really resonates to your soul. Well, I was young in the Lord. I'd only known the Lord maybe a year at this point. And I remember digging through the Scriptures And I remembered him teaching on something in Philippians, and this verse just resonated with my soul, and it's found in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. I resonated with, with all that Paul was saying here. And he says in verse 12, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and to receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, 
is calling us. Amen? I re, I, I'm putting aside the past and I'm reaching forth unto what is before. And I, I looked at this text and I went before it and I, I began to read the heart of Paul. And Paul was a Jew. He was a Jew of all Jews. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was probably one of the most premier people in his culture at that time. And he goes back to verse number one and he says, whatever happens, dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things. I do it to safeguard your faith. In other words, he's saying, look, I'm sharing this with you. And by the way, Paul and Philippians were dealing with false teaching. There were those who were coming in and they were, they were trying to press false teaching upon the church. And Paul was writing to the church at Philippi saying, look, I want to remind you of the core of your faith. I want to remind you of what is most important. Now realize something. Paul had a past that, that he thought was pretty great, and he goes on to share it. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil. Verse 2, whose mutilators who say that you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship up by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. He's talking about the circumcision in Christ Jesus. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Verse 3. This is Paul's heart. He's saying, look, man, I was one of you. I've been there. I've been probably one of the best ones you've ever seen. But I put no confidence in human flesh anymore. It is all about Christ for me. Though I could have had confidence in my own effort, if anyone could, Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. And he goes on to explain in verse number five. He says, though you think you have confidence, I really believe in, in, in Judaism, I could have had more confidence and I had more standing and more place. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I had a pure blood citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there was ever one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous, I harshly, per I, I harshly persecuted them in church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. See, Paul was one who had not only persecuted the church, but Paul consented to Stephen's death. He consented to the death of many believers. And Paul was, in essence, a murderer. You talk about a comeback. When God grabbed his soul and turned his life, there was something that happened in him that changed his life forever. And in verse number seven, he says, I once thought these things were valuable. Did you hear that? I once thought... These things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Amen? Folks, our faith, we are rooted in Christ Jesus. We are not Baptist. We are not church people. We are not Americans who go to church. We are redeemed citizens of heaven by the blood and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to identify ourselves that way. We are men and women whose lives have been transformed by the Savior. How much does it affect what you're going to do today and tomorrow? That's the question. Yes, verse 8, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything is worthless. You know, I, I had a conversation Friday night with a brother. And he was telling me, he said he deals with uh, older folks. The average age of his clientele is about 68. And he said, you know, his clientele, he said, it's amazing as people get older, he goes, they get more selfish. He actually said this to me. He goes, you know, he goes, I, he goes, I really think, he goes, I've had people look at me and say that if I could spend, if I knew I was going to die in three days and I could spend my last penny right before I died, I'd do it. He goes, do you realize, and he's, he and I were talking, he said, do you realize how off mission people are? It's all about us. It's all about what I want. 
It's all about me. We, we don't realize that Christ saved us, changed us, and made us stewards of the grace and gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? We are stewards of God's kingdom in this world. We are citizens of heaven. We are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, look, I consider it all worthless because of what Christ has done. Everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ my Lord. And Paul steps in and he says, for his sake, for Christ's sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. That's Paul's passion. Paul's saying, man, I had a lot of priorities in my life in my past, but not anymore. This is my priority now. Christ Jesus. He's the focal point. He's the one that I want. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law, but rather I become righteous through faith in Christ. Then he says, for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. And then Paul expresses three desires. In verse 10, he says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Folks, when's the last time you woke up every day saying, I want to know Jesus better today? I want to know his word. And he communicates to us through his word. And I want to know him. And I want to know him through his word so that I can experience in this life the resurrected life that Jesus has. Christ is alive. I want him to live through this flesh. That's what Paul's saying. It's a resurrected living life. And then, how's this? Paul goes, and I want to suffer like he suffered. Oh, well, wait a second, Pastor. I thought, you know, we we're just supposed to be smiling and enjoying church and feeling good about going to heaven. I thought that's what this was all about. No, it's not. We're to be stepping out and taking risk and saying, Lord, if it costs me, if it costs me my reputation because of Jesus, if it costs me my friendships, if it costs me things, I am willing to do it. I'm willing to suffer for the glory of Jesus Christ. Folks, if you can't do it when you're willing, when, when you're free to do it, guess what? You may not do it when you're forced to do it. Be careful. We think, oh, well, if I'm persecuted, then I'll stand up for Jesus. I got news for you. If you can't stand up for Jesus when you're not persecuted, what makes you think you can do it when you are persecuted? This idea that, that somehow, that's why God tells us in His Word that we are to exercise ourselves to godliness. Why? To prepare. It's just like if you ask me tomorrow to go run a, a, a 10K marathon, uh, yeah, you and I'd be laughing a whole lot. I am no more prepared for that than I am to walk around my neighborhood block right now. But that's what we think spiritually. We live in this, this weird utopia that thinks that, well, you know, I, I know Jesus and I, and I go to church and it means I'm ready. No, you're not. No, no, no more than I'm ready to run a 10K. And that's the thing that I think we so forget, that we need to be renewing ourselves before the Lord to prepare us to exercise our faith. You know what? If I can't trust God in the little things right now, if you can't give 10% of your income to God, guess what? You're not going to sacrifice later. If you can't give 10% of your time now to God and say, God, use me and help me to serve you, you're not going to sacrifice later. If you can't give 10% of your talent to God? What makes you think that when you're put under pressure, you're going to give it? Paul said, I choose. I want to suffer with him. I want to share in his death. I want to share in this idea of sacrifice. See, Paul said it in Romans 12. He said, I beg you, brethren, present yourselves a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen? He wants us to choose to be a living sacrifice. Choose to set aside our wants and our, our desires and for His glory. And then he says, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection of the dead. I want to live in that freedom that comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's saying. He says, well, how do I do that? How do I experience that? How do I move into that? Paul gives us three things here that I think are powerful. Three things about renewal. Paul did a few things in his renewal that I would suggest we do in ours. Number one, he discerned what hindered him. He discerned, verses 7 and 8, he discerned what hindered him in this process. Paul had to let go of all the things he thought was most important, considering them as distractions to the grace and presence of God in, their life, in his life. What's hindering you from putting Christ as the priority? See, in order to do that, as I've been talking to you about, that we need to be confessing our sin. Well, guess what? If we're not paying attention to our sin, we're not going to confess it. You got to get distractions out of your life so you can see what truly is important to God's heart. You have to recognize. You have to, you have to transfer the ownership of what's going on from others to yourself. You've got, to, you've got to choose humility. You've got to be determined. And you've got to renew your focus, set new priorities. You know, I, um, I know for some of you this is going to sound really radical, okay? But when I came to Christ, I had hair longer than you. I had an attitude that made a gutter look clean, Okay? And when I came to Christ, I had a souped up 1968 Cutlass Supreme 354 barrel under the hood with, a, with mags. And I thought I was large and in charge. And I will never forget. These are turning points. These are things that I remembered that hindered me. I remember one day I, I had been saved about a year and I was in the youth group. I was a leader in the youth group. And, and uh, we used to go out visiting every Thursday night. We'd go out on visitation. And this one Thursday night, the youth pastor canceled visitation. And the wonderful, humble servant of God that I am, I was furious. I thought, how unspiritual. You know, Mr. Pharisee here. I thought, how unspiritual and how ungodly. And I'll never forget God using this in my life. I went out, I got, I called the youth pastor, said, ah, give me some cards, man. I'll go visit some people. So I got like three or four cards and I went out that night and guess what? Not one person was home. Yeah, Mr. Spiritual here, not one person was home. And I was furious. I was like, God, what is going on here, man? I'm wanting to serve you, man. You know, and I'll never forget this. I'm driving back home. I'm on Thomas Road and 51st Avenue in Phoenix. And I'm driving home. And Thomas Road and 51st Avenue used to be a four-lane road, two on each side, and it narrowed into a two-lane, one. I drove up to the light. I'm heading west. I drove up to the light, and I stopped, and I'm, I'm just fuming. And some friends from school pulled up next to me and decided to moon me through the window. And that just kind of pushed me over the edge, all right? So I dropped that thing down, and I thought, I'm going to let them have it, and I'm going to leave them in my smoke. And so I did. I popped that thing, and I took off, and they're not next to me. I'm thinking, man, I'm ripping them. About that time, I look in my rearview mirror, and I got red and, red and blue bubbles going off in my mirror. I let off the accelerator really fast before I broke the speed limit, okay? And uh, pulled over the side of the road. They drove by laughing the whole way. To make a long story short, I ended up going before a judge. The judge dismissed it. He said the only people that get 
written up for exhibition of speed or teenagers and he goes, I'm tired of it and he wrote it off. But that's not what was most important from that event. What was most important is I went home that night and the Holy Spirit grabbed my soul and said, Rick, that car is your idol. You love that car more than you love me. And you love more than that, you love the power that car gives you. I've been saved a little over a year, and I'm telling you what, it was so clear in my heart and mind that God wanted me. He didn't want me to have that car. And those of you who are old enough to remember this will get a kick out of this. But I prayed, and I sold that car. And I drove a Vega after that. (laughs) I will tell you that God taught me humility, especially when it took 10 quarts of oil to drive from Los Angeles to Phoenix in that Vega when I was in college. But I will tell you it was a turning point in my spirit, in my life. I knew that that was a point of hindrance for me. It was a point of pride. Everybody around me thought I'd lost my mind. But I will never forget that when I made that renewal, when I made that decision, I discerned that, you know, this was hindering me. There were other things too that God brought to my heart. That was a big one. Folks, what's hindering you from renewing yourself in Christ? What's hindering you from from saying, God, I want to just walk forward in your glory? Because that's what Paul wanted. And that brings me to the second thing. Not only did he discern what hindered him, but secondly, he discovered what he wanted. He discovered what he wanted. In verses 9 through 11, people ultimately get what they want. Don't ever forget that. You and I ultimately get what we want. If we want righteousness, we'll have it. If we want unrighteousness, we'll have it. The Word of God says, whatever a man sows, that will he reap. And guess what? You always reap more than you sow. Always. You plant one kernel of corn, you reap a whole stock. You don't reap one kernel of corn. The honest truth is there are principles in life. And if you want to glorify God, if you want this life to make a difference, if you want the flesh that you have been given and this opportunity for such a time as this to bring God glory, now is that time. If you want that, you'll do it. If you'll want that, you'll dedicate yourselves to the thing that's most important. Paul said it this way. He said, I want to know Christ more. I want to experience his resurrection power. I want to suffer with him. I want the joy and freedom of serving him in this life. Paul defined what he wanted. After that car incident, I went to a barber shop because I determined at that point I knew God was working on me to, to serve him with my life. And in the generation that I was in, the long hair on a guy meant that I had a rebellious spirit. That's what it meant. doesn't mean, I don't think it means that today, but it meant that then, culturally. So I'll never forget, I, went, I had a hair down to here. I went to a barber shop. I got my hair cut. My best friend thought I lost my mind. And I looked at him and I said, I can't honor the Lord with this kind of an appearance. Now, that brother is still my dear friend today. He's the first guy I ever led to Christ. And then he and I went out. We said, you know what? We want to know the Lord better. And so we went out. We went to, how many of you remember the I Found It campaign years and years ago? Okay. Well, he and I went. And we got trained. And I'll never forget that part of the training was you left there and you went and knocked on doors to talk about, hey, I found it. I found Christ. So we did. I'll never forget it. We walked up to this one house, knocked on the door. They said, oh, come on in. This is great. We're thinking, oh, wow, this is awesome. We get to share, you know. We go in. It was a Jehovah's Witness house. (laughs) And I'll never forget, he and I are sitting there on the couch, and they're just blasting us with stuff, and he and I are going like this, going, 
I know that's not true, but I can't find it. I know it's not true, but I can't find it. I know it's not true, but I can't find it. And, and we walked out of there that day, and I'll never forget it. We walked out of there, and he and I decided to study God's Word together so that that would never happen again. And you know what? To this day, I use that training for the glory of God. My point to you is this. When you decide what you want, then you start pursuing it. You want to glorify God. You want to get to know his word. You want to share your faith. Guess what? Put aside the fear. Choose. God will do something glorious. And then lastly, he determined how to get it. Verses 12 to 14. This is my life verse. These are the verses that have propelled me for years. And I believe they propelled Paul. Because a single-minded passion that forgets the past and focuses on a new future, a new adventure, a new risk. Paul said this, forgetting what was behind. You know what he thought? I'm forgetting the fact that I'm a, a Pharisee. I'm forgetting the fact that I'm a Jew of Jews. But he also knew he was forgetting that he was a murderer. He was forgetting the sins, the hurts, the offenses, the habits, the priorities. And he reached forth to what was before, a new habit, a new passion. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. And he goes on to say, put to death these things and put on these things. Paul did the same thing here. He was reaching forth for what was before, putting off those old habits, putting on the new, and saying, God, use me in a new way. And then he pressed in. He was persistent and he pursued. You know, folks, this is where I am today. It's where I've been for the last 42 years but more so today than ever. And those of you who are near my age, I want to speak to you for a moment because we need to be the lightning rods of the glory and power of the Lord Jesus Christ to the next generation. And I'm going to tell you something. It kills me when we think that we live this life for retirement. There is no retirement in the Word of God. You and I are called to serve Him in the fullness of who we are. My dad passed away at 63 years of age. You know what that means for me? If I live to my father's age, I have three years with which to serve Jesus. If God is gracious and I make it to 70, I've got 10. Don't be counting your life. Well, I'm 65 years old. You should be listening to me. Now, how about counting it according to the grace of God, of what you have left? I'm praying God gives me 25 more years. I'll make it to 85 but I'm going to tell you, every one of them are going to be for His glory. Every one of them are going to be using my gifts, my talents, my treasures, every part of who I am to bring glory to God. It's a constant passion of renewal. Church, if this church, if you as God's children are going to be glorifying to the Lord Jesus Christ, quit tracking your life by your age and start tracking your life by what God's got given you left. Use it for the glory of His name. It's time, folks, to renew. It's time to burn for the glory of God. We live in a world that is desperately in need of Jesus. More than ever before. Get off your hobby horses. Get off your idiosyncrasies. Get off your pettiness and get back to the simplicity of Christ Jesus and the glory of the cross and the glory of the resurrection. We as God's people are the ambassadors to this nation and we need to be the people that rise up and renew ourselves before Him. To be passionate. Folks, God has shown us His incredible mercy his incredible forgiveness on the cross. He has, he has caused us because of that to say, look, you need to forgive others who have hurt you. And you need to go out and you need to forgive, ask forgiveness of those that you've hurt. 
But we also need to renew ourselves to a new path forward. So I've got three things I want to ask you to consider this morning. You, if you know Christ as your Savior, you are a redeemed person and you need to recognize that your sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ. We had you write your sins on cards and put them on that cross. I'm asking Bonnie to go and to, to share with you an illustration of what that means and what does that look like. When your sins and my sins have been placed at the cross, our sins are covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Ephesians 1.7 who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. 1 Peter 2.24 But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen? We have been cleansed, something we don't deserve. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but your aimless conduct received by the traditions of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Folks, we need to recognize that where we are today is all because of what Christ has done. Amen? Not because of what we've done. So that means that every moment he gives us in this life, we need to use it for his glory. Secondly, you need to resolve the offenses in your life. I'm, I'm going to tell you, one of the things I noticed as I looked in those cans and Byron's going to bring me those. Is that there are twice as many names in those who have hurt me as there are in those who I have hurt. I'm going to tell you, that is telling. It means that we're not good self-awareness people. Folks, I got news for you. We are sinners. Yes, we're redeemed sinners, but we're sinners, and we hurt people all the time. And when we don't recognize how deeply we've hurt people, our effectiveness for the gospel is hindered. Amen? I told you I was going to burn these. Even though I'd love to give you a new building, I'm not going to. You know, I hope that you have dealt with the names of the people on these pages, that you've gone to the people that you've hurt, and that you've forgiven the people that have hurt you, and that you can rejoice in the fact that once that's done, literally you are seeing the face of Jesus. I hope if you wrote a name down that you went and dealt with it. But I want you to know it's to be remembered no more. Move forward. Amen? And lastly, I want to ask you to renew yourself today. On the back wall back there is a stake in the ground. Stake in dirt. There are many times in the life of Israel where they would build a memorial signifying what God had done in that moment to forget the past and to move forward. One I think about is the rocks at, at, at the Jordan River when they went across into the Promised Land. I want to challenge you today to put a stake in the ground and say, God, from this day forward, I know for me that the day that I surrendered my life to full-time service and ministry was at a youth camp. I was... 18 years old, and I truly believed that God was going to, that God had a plan for me 
And I asked him, I said, God, I want to surrender my life to you. Use me as whatever you want. And, and then I said this, God, I only have one request. I said, don't make me a pastor. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work. But anyway, here's my point. Surrender, renew, put a stake in the ground and whatever's holding you back from that renewal. We've got some white rocks over there. And I want to challenge you to take the marker and whatever you think's holding you back, Whatever you think is, is either, either what's holding you back, write it on here, or what's the commitment you're making to God moving forward, write it on here. I want you to write it with the marker, and I want you to bury it in that dirt and say, from this day forward, I'm going to renew and honor the Lord with the rest of life of what he gives me. Amen? So I'm going to ask you to do that after we're done here. Maybe you want to take communion. Maybe you want to pray. I don't know, whatever that takes. But I ask that you dedicate yourself afresh and anew. You see, God is all about comebacks, renewals, restarts, and start overs. His next comeback is when he returns to take his children home in the air. Amen? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But in the meantime, let's be like Paul. Forgetting that which is behind, reaching forth into that which was before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray for your people. I pray for us together, Lord, that we would be a people, Lord, that would renew ourselves to you and be a light and salt in the world in which we live. And God, I pray for those that don't know you as Savior who are hearing this message that maybe they would say, I need a change. I need a renewal. I need a change in my life. And God, I need you to change me. I hope that, Lord, they will realize that you died for them. You were buried. You rose again. You're alive today, and they can come into your life, that you'll come into their life and change them. God, help them to say yes to you today. God, we commit ourselves to you, and we bring you glory in our obedience. And all God's people said, I'll be up here. If you want to take communion, you want to meet at the wall, whatever God lays on your heart, will you go? God bless you.